So the first chart I wanted to show you is really how a mutual fund is actually organized, okay? As you see, everything is surrounding the fund. Everything is surrounding the fund. Um, the fund in and of itself is its own entity, but it's a pass-through entity, which means it's owned by the owners, which is the shareholders. So uh, funds have shareholders, that's where they get its money um, for investing. As you know, the fund has a number of different folks. They actually have the investment advisor, there's an independent accountant, there's a, a custodial bank that holds the assets, there's a record keeping um, type of thing, there's, there's a, an administrator. Uh, shareholders are getting um, direct uh, input to the fund through the board of directors that are there to represent the shareholders in the fund. So in terms of how mutual funds are actually structured, they are their own entities owned by the shareholders. They have a lot of, of uh, companies that are involved or parts of the company that's involved in helping to run the fund for the shareholders. And the shareholders have that oversight through a board of directors. So it's very similar to you know, a corporate structure uh, with slightly different uh, issues. So that's where I wanted to start with you. Where do I wanna go from here? Uh, well, let's go to some uh, characteristics. I'm gonna go ahead and blow this up a little bit, make it a little bit larger. Uh, so you actually see who are the owners of mutual funds um, in 2009. So first of all, just to understand that a lot of individuals, 101 million individuals in 2009 owned mutual funds representing about 50, almost 59 million households. Um, in terms of who these folks are, uh, they are solidly middle-aged, uh, 51 is the median. Um, over two-thirds of these folks are married or living with a partner and, and saving. Over half of these folks are college grads, okay? Um, most of them are working either full or part-time. Uh, there are, and then the percentages of what generation is owning. So the, what would they call the silent generation? Uh, those that were born, you know, before, you know, when they had pet dinosaurs uh, listed here. Uh, baby boomers uh, are, are listed here. They own about a third. A third are, are owned by Gen X folks. Those that are born between 65 and 1980. And about a quarter of the millennials are, are, are Gen Zs are actually on them. Uh, what's important to know is that the median household income is high, $100,000. So these are the folks that are they're able to have investments because they have enough money to take care of the basics. Right? Uh, what do they own in terms of this? So their their median assets are pretty high quarter of a million dollars which i mean it sounds like a lot of money it really really isn't uh they actually have a lot of mutual fund assets One hundred and fifty thousand dollars of mutual fund assets is the the median remember the median is that middle number in a line of numbers so one two three four five the middle number is three it's right in the middle that's the median right um 67% of these folks hold more than half of their assets in mutual funds. So mutual funds are a popular vehicle, even for folks that have uh, some money. Two thirds of them have mutual funds in, uh, in their IRAs or through their IRAs, which we're gonna be talking about next week, individual retirement accounts, okay? Um, almost 85% own them through retirement plans. So a defined contribution plan is a 401k plan for example, okay. Uh, the median number of mutual funds that these folks own is four, four different funds. And almost all of them have a stock fund. An equity fund is a stock fund, right? So they have stock. So most of them are investing in stocks. Um, half of them made their first purchase before 2000. So they've had a long ride since then. Uh, about two thirds of them bought these through their employer sponsored plans, which is, that's why you have to know about this is because you're probably gonna be part of that figure there. Um, in terms of why they invest, as you see, almost all of them invest for retirement. Mutual funds are designed for the long-term. 
And so that makes perfect sense. Uh, half of the people that own mutual funds put the money there as savings for emergencies. Um, about half of them also own mutual funds to reduce any income uh, tax that they, they need to pay in a particular year. And about a quarter of them are, are owning them for, uh, for education related purposes. Uh, let's go up a couple of pages so I can show you uh, some of the financial goals. So what are the, the main goals uh, for mutual fund owners as you see, um, whether it's just a financial goal in general or the primary goal, the main reason. As you see, retirement is the number one. So this is gonna be um, a continued topic next week where we talk about um, retirement and retirement plans like your the 401ks through what employers would provide you or opening up your own IRA, individual retirement account. Um, mutual funds are a primary way of, of getting there. But as you see, uh, some folks have it as, you know, emergency or other types of issues as well. All right. Um, another thing we've talked a little bit about is uh, the willingness to take risk, right? Because you have to sort of understand um, the idea to take risk. So here you have charts that are all U.S. households are listed here and then breaking, broken down by generation, right? So the most Generation Z and Millennials, these are the folks that were recently, so you guys are in that group uh, overwhelmingly here in this class. Although some folks are gonna be part of Gen X, some folks are gonna be baby boomers, sorry, um, et cetera. As you see, um, substantial risk is, is that little mark of purple. Uh, and as you see, the younger you are, the more risk you're gonna take. The older you are, the less risk you're gonna be taking because you need that money. Uh, you, you really, can't afford to be losing money at an older age because you don't have any time to make it back. You know, you just don't. Um, you'll also see in terms of investing in funds that are a little above average risk. So um, aggressive growth or, or things like that. As you see, the younger generations here have the most uh, in the green, that's the risky. Right? They're more risky than the general population. As you see, the older you get, you're not going to be taking that risk. You just need the money, so you're not going to be you're not going to be willing to risk a lot of your dough, okay, um, in those types of funds. Okay, uh, folks that are just seeking an average risk for average gain it seems to be the majority. Of course, as you get older, that's a little bit more than the majority. Uh, folks that are not taking much of any risk or no risk at all uh, are the blues here. So in the general population, it's relatively, uh, for those that own mutual funds, it's relatively low, 19%. Um, it goes a little bit higher as you get older because you don't want to take those types of risks as you get older. But look at the folks that don't own any funds at all. Right? These are, this is one of the most important things that poverty perpetuates itself for folks that it doesn't have to, is they're, not, they're unable to convince themselves that they need to take certain investment risk. It can be reasonable risk. But as you see, if two thirds of people who don't own mutual funds don't wanna take their, any risks whatsoever, well then it, you know, you're not gonna really kind of get those types of returns that you need to kind of move ahead uh, down the road. Um, so that's somewhat important. Let's go over a few basics as well uh, in terms of this. How big are mutual funds worldwide? Uh, they're quite big. 50, this is 54, almost $55 trillion. This is worldwide. Worldwide, $55 trillion in 2019. Okay, um, that's up from 20, 28, 29 trillion in 2011, 2012. So just in that 10 years period of span, uh, it's, it's almost doubled in terms of how popular mutual funds are. Um, so in terms of what we said, open-ended funds, which is the most, the vast majority of mutual funds, 
back in 2010, there were 86,000 funds in total. There are over 122,000 funds in 2019. So there's a huge growth in the number of funds. And then what types of funds? Let's focus on, on where this $55 trillion is put. Uh, the most, vast majority of this, 45% of all the monies are in equity funds. An equity fund is a stock fund. So as you see most, so almost $25 trillion worldwide in mutual funds is invested in stock funds. Okay, 11.8 um, trillion, 21% are in bond funds. So this is the bond fund here, up at the bond fund is up here. Um, there's a mix of stock and bond funds, balance funds, mixed funds. They're almost as large, 11.6. And then 6.9 trillion, almost $7 trillion is, is in the money market fund. So these are extremely large, um, a part of the investment world globally. Again, this is a worldwide assets in open-ended funds, which are traditional mutual funds that you and I know of. Um, let's, keep, let's keep looking here a little bit. Uh, very specifically, did I pass it? Oh, hang on. Uh, what did I do? Sorry, this is supposed to be a little bit more smooth than I actually had. I thought I had the right uh, number here. Yeah, US registered. Oh, okay, all right. This is the figure I wanted, sorry. So um, it is on that page. I just didn't go down more. <laughs> all right, I'm an idiot. Um, in the U.S., this is strictly United States. The other one we looked at is worldwide because, you know, we're not the only ones who invest money. Yeah. Um, everyone around the world invests money. Uh, for the U.S., it's 25, almost $26 trillion of assets are in mutual funds and, EF and ETFs. Okay. And most of that is in equity funds. Now, domestic equity means they're U.S. stocks. Right, domestic. Uh, there's actually world equity funds, which means that these are stocks, but for company uh, companies that are global or, in other, or based in other countries. So as you see between the two of these, equity funds represent most of where investors put their money uh, in the mutual fund market. So most of this $25.7 trillion is in stock funds. 20% of it is in, a, is in bond funds. 14% uh, are in money market funds. And the other portion is in all the other funds, which are usually mixed or hybrid funds. Okay. Um, and so that's, uh, that's really important. One thing that you'll notice here on the next uh, chart, and actually I did, did the right thing this time. Uh, what's really, really grown over time is index funds. Um, funds that basically track an index like the S&P 500, like the Dow Jones, industrials, like the NASDAQ 1000, uh, the Russell 2000. I mean, there's a whole bunch, which are the NASDAQ 100. And then there's indexes, of course, all around the world. Um, as you see that in 2009, there were eight and a half trillion dollars in index funds. Okay. So again, that represented only 10% of all the mutual funds uh, at that time. And EFTs were only 8%. Uh, you go 10 years later, 2019, it's grown from eight and a half trillion to 22 trillion. They become extremely popular. So index mutual funds now represent almost 20%, as do ETFs. 
Okay, they have just basically been exceptionally popular choices for people because they're easy to understand and they're, the fees are very low for the shareholders. And so there, there's a one-two punch that makes it very, very tolerable here. Um, let's talk a little bit about ETFs. Okay. Um, in terms of ETF, ETFs, the U.S. has the largest market in ETFs. So we have 70% of all electronic traded funds are U.S. based. Uh, worldwide assets are over six trillion. So most of that is US based. Okay. So that's, um, that's relatively important. And on the next page, uh, just to show you that they have really grown. Okay. This is a chart um, in billions. So the number of electronic traded funds in 2010 there was only 923 um, ETFs to choose from. You go about 10 years later, there are over 2000. So they more than doubled in number. Uh, that's how popular uh, that they are. That's how popular they are. Um, and so in terms of looking at mutual funds from a, a bigger perspective, that's the Investment Company Institute's uh, annual report. They do an annual report and give you all types of figures. And I'll put that up on the website for us so you can browse through that. It's a pretty good size book, um, but it's interesting for a lot of folks to read. So I'll put it up there. But as you see, uh, mutual funds are a standard for particularly in the retirement, uh, for retirement purposes. And so you have to become more familiar with those. Uh, and that's why I focused on that. Any questions on some of the things that we just looked at there? Okay, that's, that's a big picture. Worldwide, were you surprised at how many trillions of dollars are in this? Right. And again, and, and everyone around the world invests. We're, we're, it's not like it's just an American thing. Uh, okay, I mean, it's you know what I think is weird? You mentioned <clears throat> the people or the median amount uh, of money the families make that are into the stock market. And, you know, I've older come across a lot of people and it's like people who make money, have money, are in the stock market, bonds, they do something. Yeah. And it kind of reminds me of uh, like diet coke i always see fat people drinking diet coke i'm like does diet coke make you fat or do fat people drink diet coke i'm like does being in the market make you rich or are you rich and you're in the market i you know it's like it's it question good question well, i don't have an answer for you <laughs> um but it's a good question to think about uh it's important particularly for everyone who, and particularly a lot of you are, are younger and starting out, uh, when you do get a chance to create a retirement account that you do so. Um, and that as a young person, you'd need to, you know, you need to be part of the market. Uh, the easiest way to do that is through an index fund. And I'm gonna show you a little bit about that. So we're gonna jump from that to Fidelity. Okay, so we're gonna we're gonna take a trip to uh, Fidelity uh, Investments. Okay. All right. So welcome to Fidelity uh, Investments. Um, I'll make it a little bit larger if I can here without ruining the the page. Um, no, 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 no. I've looked today, Tesla's up. So uh, uh, disclosure, I do have a, a, a small retirement account at Fidelity, but I'm not gonna show you. <laughs> um, but to open an account, you there's a way to open an account. There are several ways in which you can do. If you are saving for retirement, then you open up uh, for yourself. You can open up an IRA account. We're gonna be talking about these 
uh, next week where we talk about uh, retirement plans. But if you just simply wanted to open up an account yourself for investing and trading, you can simply open up a brokerage account. Um, and, uh, and that will do, that will do. Some people like a special account for saving for education. So they open up a 529. Um, and then there's some other types of things that they also have. But for the most part, a uh, brokerage account for general. And if you're looking to open up a, a retirement account, you can do an IRA. And we'll go over that again in more detail. Let's go to mutual funds so you can see a little bit about uh, how this works. So first of all, they want to know what your criteria is. Right? So I'm going to put a low minimum investment, no transaction fees. I'm going to stick to Simply Fidelity funds because they actually list a whole bunch. And then I'm going to go ahead and select now Morningstar is an organization like S&P, like Moody's, that actually rates mutual fund performance over time. So I'm gonna go ahead and pick a, a five-star fund. Those are the best rankings. And as you see, there are 30 matches. So let's find out who those matches are, okay? And what you have here is a whole list of funds that, that start with, uh, Fidelity Blue Chip grow, uh, Growth Fund and go all the way down here until you get to a small cap value fund. Okay, there's some foreign funds as well. What you'll notice on uh, in the category here, and I'll make it a little bit larger because it seems to get smaller on me all the time, um, is that the first thing you see is the name of the fund. Uh, what you see underneath the name of the fund is the symbol for the fund, okay, for the symbol for the fund. You'll see the category of the fund, which is important because this category is important to you because this is going to tell you whether these companies are large or small, blue chip or uh, growth. Um, and, you know, it's important to sort of understand exactly where you're at. So the blue chip growth fund, as you would imagine, the word blue chip means large companies. But growth means that they're growing, uh, their sales are going up, et cetera. So this is a large growth mutual fund. And as you see, it's done quite well this year, year to date. So January 1st till the very last day that this was posted yesterday, it's up. 47, almost 48% this year. So it's, that's remarkable, that's remarkable. Over the full year, over the three-year period, over the five-year period, over the 10-year period, over the life of the fund, whenever it was actually created, this fund is indeed worth the five stars that Morningstar gave it because it has, has outstanding performance for all of this time period. This particular fund is strictly in technology. This is a sector fund which means that all of the money in this portfolio is simply invested in that sector. This is the same thing for health. This is a health fund. It's very specific to that sector. This is also a, se a sector fund specifically for retail. Okay. Here's a large growth, but this is over the counter. So it's a NASDAQ market. This is a, uh, this is a global fund. This is an, a Pacific Asia uh, fund minus Japan. X Japan does, means Japan is not included in that. So uh, again, it has a very high rate of return, as you see, um, for the year, and it has for many years done quite well. This is another healthcare portfolio, so it's specific to that. This is specific to communication. This is a specific uh, regional fund, so this is specific to China. How they define China will be listed in the prospectus. And I'm going to take you through all of those uh, pretty soon. This is a worldwide stock fund, large companies. Okay, so all over the world. Uh, diversified means that it's different markets, emerging markets. So it could be Asia, could also be uh, part of, of South America, Latin America, could be part of Africa, whatever is emerging. A balanced fund here. Uh, means a, a mix of stocks and bonds. And here they actually call it what it is. It's an allocation fund. So asset allocation means part stock, part bond. 
And here this is 50 to 70% equity, which means it's 50 to 70% of this fund is invested in stocks. Remember the word equity is the same as stock. Okay. Um, and lo and behold, all the way down here. Okay. This is a different type of an asset allocation because this is a multi-asset income fund. So it has less money in stocks, more money in bonds because it's income based. And again, all the way down, here's a small cap stock, very a blended stock, more risk, but more, uh, but investors are looking for more return. Here's a dividend and income fund. So funds that have equity. So this is a stock fund, 70 to 85% stock that pay dividends. Okay. Uh, and all the way down we go to you have a small cap fund. So this is a small, small company fund with the purpose of value. This is a mid company fund, value fund. Okay. So again, that's why I had you do your investor profile to know exactly where you where you fit in terms of that. Let's take a look at the blue chip growth stock you sh uh, in, in specific, we'll go here. Uh, one thing that you'll see is there's an information page. There's a fact sheet, a perspective. I'm gonna look into this with you, but first let's read this uh, puppy a little bit. One thing to know is uh, it'll have the Morningstar snapshot, which is again that company that analyzes mutual funds. This is a five-star rating. It's the best rating you can have for Morningstar. Not a lot of funds have it. This fund does, uh, as you see, high returns with uh, for a category of risk that's medium, medium. So look at this risk scale from low to high. And this is sort of right in the middle. So for the, a lot of, for the amount of risk you're taking, you're getting a much higher return than the risk you're taking. So that's why this has got five-star rating. And as you see, this is the year to date, which is January 1st to yesterday. Um, and then this is the full year. So take today's date and go back a year and look at that's the return. Three years, each year for three years, each year for five years, each year for 10 years. So this, this fund has done well, no doubt about it. You'll notice too, uh, you'll know the companies in this fund because they tell you about the top 10 stocks they have in the fund. Top 10 holdings is basically, these are the top 10 stocks we have in the fund, okay? So, and you probably know every single one of these companies, okay? You probably have heard of, of all of them. Um, even though these are the top 10 holdings, they represent about half of all the money in the portfolio. <laughs> so uh, I will get to see, I'll show you how big this portfolio is in a minute, but almost half of the entire portfolio is invested in these 10 companies. How many stocks is in the portfolio? Well, that's the holdings. They have 418 different stocks in the portfolio. These are the top 10, but they obviously have 408 more stocks in the portfolio that you'll see. Okay, so this is just sort of a synopsis of what's in the portfolio. When you see a top 10, this is basically the types of companies they're investing in. So this is why you have the blue chip, right? Because Apple, Amazon, Microsoft, Google, Facebook, these are enormous companies. They're not going anywhere. So they have an incredible value, blue chip. Let's go to some details. Uh, the category is the type of fund it is. So this is a large company fund, growth related. So these companies are still growing quite well. Uh, important that you learned the other day, what's the price of the fund? That's the NAV. So to buy one share of this fund will cost you $152.77 as of the 17th of November. Okay. So that is an important factor to know. Another important factor to know is how big is this portfolio? What are you actually, what are you being a, a shareholder in? You're being a shareholder of this fund, the blue chip, what's the name of it? Blue chip growth fund, which has 39 billion, $699 million in the portfolio. So you're going to be an investor with a whole bunch of other investors in this fund that equal 
nearly $40 billion worth of, of money. So your $1,000 investment, for example, is gonna be part of this $40 billion that's invested. So as that 40 billion does well, you do well, okay? Uh, so this is how you get to play with, with everybody else. This uh, price, NAV of $152.77 is for one share. It's changed over the 12 months. So if you look back from uh, last October to this October, this sh the share price in this fund, to be a part of owner in this fund, people have bought it as low as $81.70 for a share of the fund, as high as $159.84 for a share of the fund. Obviously it's very close. The current price is very close to the high. And that's because these high prices, the value of the, of the assets are higher when the stock market is up, <laughs> okay? So uh, clearly we're at almost, we're at all time highs uh, in terms of the, the s and well, not the S&P, but the, certainly the Dow Jones. The S&P is close to an all-time high. The uh, NASDAQ is there. So you're going to have all these indexes that are way high. The stocks are really, really high. So the portfolios are going to be worth more. Okay. So that's sort of an important understanding. Another important understanding is what is the amount of money that's dedicated to expenses? This should be well under 1%. Okay. Uh, and this is the annual fees that are that are taken out of this portfolio to cover all the expenses of the fund, from management to the custody of the assets to the record keeping, et cetera. Okay, so points zero point seven nine is much less than one percent, which is good, but you can do better. This is not outrageous, <laughs> but believe it or not, there are funds that that do better. Okay. Uh, one thing that all of these comp all of these have to show is what if you invested ten thousand dollars in this fund ten years ago? Okay, um, and so what they have here is this is the name of the fund, the symbol FBGRX is the is the symbol for this particular fund. This is the Russell one thousand index. Okay, this blue line is the Russell 1000 index. It's another index like the S&P 500, okay? Uh, but it's a growth index. And this is in general what all large companies did. So as you see over time, uh, you see the purple line, which is the fund, the fund itself, $10,000 would have grown to $52,964. That's what this tells you. Uh, well, compared to the market as or the index would have only given you 45,000. Again, nothing to sneeze at when you started with 10. Um, it would have given you 45,000, but obviously 52 is better. Um, in general, all large companies grew at a, at a pace which would have turned that 10,000 into 36,000. Again, nothing to sneeze at. I would be happy with any of those. <laughs> but as you see, the fund did much better than anything. So that's why it's got its its rating. And then you would have to pay uh, some kind of fee or something, obviously, along the way, right? No, the fee the fee comes out of the fund. You never see it, other than the fact that you don't get it as part of your return. Okay. So you never you never actually see the, those types of things. It just it's just taken out of the fund in general, including your shares of the fund. You'll be paying. So that thirty six would have been what you take after everything was said and done. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. So um, the fund manager is listed as well because this is this is the the head of the fund. These this is the person uh, or persons in some cases that are actually in doing the investing of the portfolio and managing it. Um, so it's important to know that when the manager started, in this case, this person has been here so new, has been there since July of two thousand and nine. So over that 11 year period, you can see the fund has done really well with this manager. This manager seems to have a pretty good idea of what uh, is going on and is doing a good job. This is not the only fund this manager is managing. They're managing all these other funds as well. They might've uh, might managed other funds previously. And of course the manager has uh, a synopsis of their education uh, as well. <laughs> 
So to know the manager and how long they've been there might give you an understanding of that, they're, that they are doing a good job. And then these are all the other things that they're, they're managing as well. So you might want to look at those. Mm -hmm. uh, once in, what's the most important thing to look at in any, before you pick anything is what's the objective? Why does the fund exist? In this case, it's going to seek long-term growth of capital, which means that $10,000 turns into 50,000 10 years later. That's long-term growth, right? Um, the strategy tells you how much of the portfolio is invested where. So in this case, they have to, based on the, the dynamics, they have to invest 80% of all the assets into blue chip companies. That leaves them with another 20% to do what they want. Okay. Uh, they talk a little bit about risk and, and so forth. Okay, so clearly they have they have a lot. So do you want to know a little bit more about this company? You're going to get a prospectus. Every before you invest in any company, any uh, mutual fund rather, you're going to get an ex, uh, a prospectus, and they're going to want you to check a box that you've read it. Okay, uh, but in this case, the prospectus is going to tell you the information that you really kind of need to know. Okay. Um, and so if you go down, one of the most important things you need to know that's listed in the prospectus is the fees, is the fees. Um, the fee table is listed here. And as you see, uh, the annual operating expenses are listed and that's where you get that 0.79. Notice this particular fund does not advertise. So it doesn't have a 12B1 fee. Okay, and most of the money is to pay management of the fund, which makes sense. That's you're paying the people to do it. Okay, the other expenses are you know for the custodian, for the record keeping, stuff like that. Okay, so then it actually tells you how much fees you would be paying over time. So uh, based on the amount, right, for that ten thousand dollars that you invested, if you kept it all ten years. You would have fifty-two thousand nine hundred and something, but you would have you would be paying nine hundred seventy-eight dollars in fees over that same period of time. So your your overall return would be slightly less than that because your those fees are there. Um, a portfolio turnover simply means how active the manager is trading the stocks in the portfolio. So obviously when you trade stocks, sell, buy, you're, you're, there's transaction fees and fees, that, record keeping fees, other type of fees that has to get done. So it's important that you don't have a lot of turnover in, in the portfolio. The more turnover it has, the higher the fees are gonna be because there's more work to do, okay. So <clears throat> they go over things, risk, performance, they do everything that we basically looked at earlier, um, it is provided here, including a, a you know portfolio manager and blah 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 blah. Okay, so that's important. Another thing to know, if you if people are curious like me, what exactly is in the portfolio? You know, what what stocks are in the portfolio? So the the portfolio holdings actually tells you exactly what's in the portfolio. So uh, as listed earlier, these are the top ten companies in the portfolio. Uh, Apple, Amazon, again, it's listed by market value. And as you see here, so they have $3.8 billion worth of Apple stock um, right there. Yeah, I agree. Um, they have $3.5 billion worth of Amazon stock, et cetera, et cetera, right? So this portfolio of the top 10 holes, it's, it's almost $40 billion, but about half of it is invested in these top, in these 10 stocks. What other stocks do they own? That's what they list. You wanna know what they own and how much they own of it? That's all given to you right here. So the top 10 are listed here, but as you see, if you keep going, they own Uber, they own Lowe's, they own Netflix, they own MasterCard, PayPal. You, you keep going, you know all these, because in a, in a blue chip fund, you're gonna know the companies. You're gonna know 80, 90% of these companies are gonna be like, oh yeah, I know that, they're big. I've been there, I've used their stuff, right? Some companies you might not know because they might not be unique to the Northeast. They might be a big company out in California or something. So, but, but these are all big. Marriott is here, Clorox, again, don't drink it, 
Um, you know, Wendy's is here, Ally, Darden Restaurants, which you've probably been to without knowing, Texas uh, Roadhouse, BJ's, all types. So this tells you uh, every single company that they own in the monthly report, okay? Uh, and you can do that for every, every single fund, every single fund that's listed, and I'll go back to our last thing. So every single fund that's listed um, will have, uh, I'm gonna hide that, will have it. So, um, so that's that. Another thing you can do is is ETFs. So let me go to the, did I just do that right? ETF center, right. Okay, so again, oftentimes um, you can buy ETFs through all of these. I mean, BlackRock is, is the biggest, they have, they have the most. Um, it's a big, big, big company. Fidelity has their own. You can, you can look at it through, if you want stocks or other types of things, specific stuff that you wanna buy into. Uh, what you have here, these are the gainers. Let's look at the top gainers this year for ETFs. Okay. And again, I'll make this a little bit larger so you can see. So as you see, uh, Invesco, which is a company that sells uh, things for commission. So these are, these are gonna be loads. Um, they actually had the best performing fund this year. The solar ETF was the best performing fund here, as you see. I don't know if there's any, uh, large pieces of information. I know I have to sign into my account, which I don't want to do. Um, let's pick a, uh, let's pick a fidelity fund. Will it not show me one? <laughs> it's having me, it wants me to log in and I don't want to do that. Um, let's see if there's, there's anything listed here. iShares. No, it's having me go back. Okay, so uh, you should be able to see for that as well. Um, what the uh, uh, what's what the index is that they're tracking? Okay, what the index is that they're tracking? Let me just try this. I haven't done this one before, but I'll I'll put Apple. And so here, um, if you list by the stock, they'll tell you the EFT, the ETFs rather that have exposure to that stock. So obviously, this particular uh, ETF. Technology Select sec Sector Spider Fund has the greatest exposure to Apple stock, but all of these companies have it. Oh, there's one here. It's gonna ask me to log in again. I don't wanna log in. Sorry, no offense. I just don't wanna show you any of my money. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I think you can understand that. Um, but, uh, but ETFs are, are, again, mutual, like mutual funds, they, uh, they're easier. They have much lower, much, much lower fees. As a matter of fact, if you look at an index fund for a mutual fund, which Fidelity has a lot of them, uh, if you wanna look at index funds, they'll all have very, very low fees. So all of your money will be well invested. Um, you probably have heard of uh, target date funds. Those are also quite large today in terms of what's popular. Um, that means that when you open up a 401k for your employer, you project ahead when your, when your target date for retirement is. And there's a fund for that. <laughs> you heard that there's an app for that. Now there, again, in mutual funds, there's a fund for that. So if you're gonna retire in 2050, the year 2050, there's a target date fund for 2050. There's a fund for that. So you might want to invest your money in your retirement plan in, in a fund like that, a target date fund. These are automatically managed percentage of stocks, bonds, and cash are automatically allocated. So the closer you get to 2050, in other words, the closer the time you need the money, the less risky the portfolio gets. And it's all computer generated trading. It's, it's incredible. It's really, really wonderful. Great stuff. 
Okay, so actually, I'm going to stop the recording here because it's still going. <laughs>